Hello, everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. With the warmest May on record, tick season ramped up pretty fast in Oklahoma this year. We've talked about treating livestock, and today, extension entomologist Justin Talley focuses on how to protect yourself from ticks. So about this time of year, a lot of people are getting uh, outside and increasing their activities. And with that increased outside activity, uh, you have increased exposure to ticks. And so the main thing we need to be concerned about is protecting yourself from tick-borne disease. We have several ticks in our state that can transmit different tick-borne diseases. You know, the number one that we need to think about is either ehrlichiosis or spotted fever rickettsia. Those are the two that tend to really hit Oklahomans pretty hard. In general, when you think about outdoor activities, especially when you're out either working cattle or out doing any kind of work, you're not thinking about protecting yourself from ticks. And so whether it's in the morning, in the afternoon, any time of the day, you could get a tick on you. And so the main thing you need to be concerned with is put some kind of repellent. If you're gonna put a repellent on, it usually needs to be DEET and DEET that's at a concentration of 25% or higher. Oklahoma in general is just a state that you're gonna have a lot of tick-borne disease, especially spotted fever rickettsia. Spotted fever rickettsia is gonna be transmitted by uh, a lot of what we call the American dog tick. Uh, there's some other ticks that can be involved, but mainly in Oklahoma, the American dog tick is the one that we're concerned with. The other issue is that we have a lot of ticks out there that can uh, transmit uh, spot of fever rickettsia, but it's not going to necessarily turn into a severe uh, disease in people. And that's caused by a different species of rickettsia, rickettsia parkeri, that can be transmitted by Gulf Coast ticks. The other ticks that we have that are going to be involved with tick-borne disease are Lone Star ticks and uh, what we call the brown dog tick. Brown dog tick is usually associated with uh, people in urban settings. Lone Star Tick is everywhere. Uh, the, you could see this one all the way from southeast Oklahoma all the way up to Woodward in some cases. And so we've seen this tick expand and mainly through the work at uh, OSU we've seen that expand with expansion of eastern red cedar. In general when you think about ticks and tick-borne disease and if you find a tick on you it's just about removing that tick and removing that tick properly. And what you need to do is use tweezers or your fingernails if you can, and slow steady pressure, and do not twist that tick, and do not put any substance on that tick, because it in could increase the likelihood of that tick salivating, which is where some of the pathogens are. The other issue is that when we, we have two new tick-borne viruses that uh, ticks can transmit. One is the Heartland virus, and the other is the Bourbon virus. And so they present themselves like a fever, fatigue, almost like you got the flu. And if you go and get on anti-antibiotics, you may not necessarily get, uh, you may not get any relief from those, from those uh, symptoms. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Summer's handprint is all over the weather this week and into the forecasts ahead. Our prelude to summer weather was a dramatically cool April. For much of the state, the average air temperature for April was six to seven degrees below average. May let us know summer was on its way with averages for the month five, the yellow areas, to nine degrees, the red area, above average. Just like April's coolness, May's above average air temperatures were a dramatic change from normal. Our rainfall has taken on summer patterns of showers and storms in scattered locations. On a 14-day map from May 30th to June 6th, the Alva Mesonet site collected 8 and 3 tenths inches. The yellow areas had over 4 inches of rain.
But over half of the state was shaded blue or white where less than an inch of rain fell. Even in the high rainfall areas, summer crops and grassland have drawn down soil moisture as they kicked into high growth rates. Along with higher than average air temperatures in May, the month started off with winds above average. The Spencer Mesonet site was a prime example of higher wind speeds in early May. Winds were typically 25% above average in early May at Spencer. The higher wind speeds at Spencer drove water demand above average in early May. Fortunately, wind speeds came down at Spencer in the latter part of May, and that helped water demand return to a more normal pattern. Summer plant growth really draws down the mesonet site soil moisture, similar to nearby grassland and crop fields. On a map of soil fractional water index at four inches in bare soil, it looks like the whole state has plenty of soil moisture. Most sites range from seven tenths to one. One is the wettest the soil can be. Compare that to a fractional water index map for the same day, but at four inches under a mix of grass and broadleaf vegetation. Now, only areas with decent rains are dark green. The brown areas are extremely dry from zero to three tenths. This week's drought map has slightly less exceptional drought, the blood red D4 in the west, yet slightly more D3 drought areas in the west. South central Oklahoma is white with no drought designation, while D1 moderate drought has been added in the southeast. The drought outlook for June from the Climate Prediction Center indicates further drought development is likely across central and eastern Oklahoma and drought is likely to persist across western Oklahoma in June. Drought development comes out of the June precipitation outlook of increased odds of below average rainfall and the increased odds of above average temperatures in the June temperature outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. Here's hoping you beat the odds at your house or farm and get some much needed rain. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. up with our extension cropping system specialist Josh Lofton at Lahoma as well and Josh you have some research set up here why don't you give us an idea of what's going on in this field yeah we got we got a quite a few things going on here so if, if viewers ever wanted to come Lahoma and and kind of see everything going on they can see quite a bit of good uh, soybean and milo research uh, we have going on right here what we're standing in is is looking at uh, our planning dates uh, by uh, variety and, and how we actually can agronomically optimally manage uh, our, our milo crop or our, our grain sorghum crop and how that actually influences how we have to manage our sugarcane aphid. I know everybody that does milo has heard of sugarcane aphid and that's one thing we kind of are always in, in front of but the question has become we want to plant early for sugarcane aphids uh, but the question came is can we plant too early? you know, is, is there too early to, to plant? So what we have is, is planting dates that are spaced uh, around, around three or four weeks apart, and we still got two to go on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the south side of us here. But you can tell the difference in the crop, the difference in, in how it's planted. And so we have, we have some milo just coming out of the ground. Uh, we have some that is still poking out of the ground. We, we start to see a lot of our coleoptiles still poking. This is just one of those components we have, but we have, we have several other, others right here to the south as our, our uh, sorghum hybrid performance trials. And if you want to, we can go look at some of our other stuff across the way, looking at, uh, uh, looking at herbicide management in our grain sorghum crop. Definitely, let's walk over there. Josh, tell us what you have set up in this field. Well, here we're, we're actually looking at our, our pre-plant herbicide programs for, for grain sorghum. Anybody that's grown grain sorghum across the state knows that that pre-plant herbicide can, can make or break uh, your sorghum crop, and, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. We have quite a few of these around the state because at each of our locations, we have a different weed issue. And, and what we have here is, is a volunteer wheat scenario as well as some bindweed. Uh, a lot of growers around this part of the world have some bindweed uh, and some volunteer wheat they have to deal with in their sorghum crops. So we're looking at how our pre-plant herbicide programs 
kind of fit with those, those different weed populations. And the big thing is we're wanting to see if any of these herbicide programs can be phytotoxic to that grain sorghum. We don't want to kill the sorghum, but we want to kill everything around it. And so kind of looking at and seeing what, what our systems are here, what works best for our system. If you have a certain population of weeds, what's that pre-plant program and what's that early post-plant pr program that you need to be looking into because all of them are a little bit different. Yeah, lots of good combinations and different scenarios to talk about. Yeah, and it's, it's one that we've gotten a lot of questions from the last couple of years of, oh, well, you know, I've had the, my traditional herbicide program, uh, but it hasn't worked. And so we're trying to get those answers on, on well, maybe, maybe we're getting resistance, maybe a bad application, maybe the weeds were already coming up and you just didn't see them. What are these new combinations that we can actually use to, to help our growers get a little bit more control of some of these, these early season weeds and sorghum, which we all know are just very, very critical to making a successful crop. Terrific. Well, keep us posted on this field as well as the, the first one we were in and the others around the state. We'll be sure to share it with our viewers. Very good. Thanks a lot, Josh. Thank we'll see you, you soon. Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist, joins us on assignment this week from Beijing, China. Hello, Daryl. Give us an idea of where you are and what you have going on. Well, we've been in Beijing for almost two weeks now. Uh, I've been working at uh, China Agricultural University. OSU has a, an agribusiness program uh, with this university, and so I've been here uh, to, to teach a, a course for some of the students that will eventually come to OSU in a little bit more than a year. So there's kind of a, a delegation of folks, as I understand it, from OSU who are there. Give us a little bit more of an idea of, of what this program is. It's been going on for a few years now. We have had this program for a number of years. We've had uh, three different cohorts of CAU students come to OSU. We just graduated uh, the second cohort. Um, and so this is an ongoing program where we get a new group each year. Now, what have you been teaching? Well, I've been teaching the freshman class, this year's freshman class of agribusiness students that have been selected for this program. Uh, and it's specifically, it's, it's an orientation course. It's the exact same uh, freshman orientation class that they would get if they were coming uh, straight to OSU as freshmen. Uh, so I've been trying to get them uh, prepared, uh, start thinking about the kinds of things they're gonna need for career planning, as well as uh, uh, the challenges that they will face when they come to, uh, to, the, to Oklahoma and to the US to live for a couple of years. Talk about some of the things that you have been exposed to in terms of those international markets, uh, the Chinese market and China trade in particular, uh, that may help you uh, and assist you as you come back and, and offer guidance to Oklahoma producers. Well, you know, if we focus on the beef industry, which is what I work with most of the time, uh, specifically, I have, uh, you know, while I've been teaching, I've also had uh, meetings with some industry officials here in Beijing uh, relative to the Chinese cattle industry. So I've been learning about uh, production uh, in China, the challenges they face, what opportunities they're looking at. All of these things will be important. Of course, China has emerged in the last uh, two years, really, as the second largest beef importing country in the world. Uh, rapid growth in that. And the U.S. You know, is trying to develop a share of that market. So the more we can understand about uh, the situation in China and that potential of, the, of that market going forward, uh, the more it's going to help us really both countries uh, benefit from, from that uh, continued dynamics of those trading relationships. You mentioned you'll have some other visits or travels after your stop in Beijing. What's next for you? Well, next week we will be uh, leaving Beijing. We're going to travel to uh, several other cities over the next uh, about two weeks. Uh, and a lot of it is just kind of a, uh, an orientation for me, I guess is a good way to say it, to get to, to feel a little bit uh, of the country and the, uh, and the agriculture here. Uh, we'll be traveling by train. We're going to stay on the ground, so uh, we'll get to see uh, a bit more than we would if we flew from city to city. 
And, uh, and I think that uh, that alone is going to be pretty useful. We'll be trying to uh, explore and develop some potential contacts that we can uh, build on as we go forward. Well, thanks a lot for sharing a little bit about your, your trip and the work that you and the team are, are doing there in China. Daryl, we wish you safe travels and we look forward to continuing the conversation when you get back home to OSU and Stillwater. Very good, thank you very much. We've reached that part of early summer when fall calving herds will soon be weaning the calves. And certainly uh, the weaning process is stressful enough, not alone during some of these very hot uh, summer days that we'll have. I think we want to consider the management strategy called fence line weaning at this time of the year. Uh, this was developed out in California clear back in 2002 when researchers took a look at the impact of what they called fence line weaning where the calves were just weaned on one side of the fence from their mothers as compared to completely separating the calves from the cows where they were out of sight, out of mind, couldn't be smelled or heard. As they compared those two groups of calves, what they found was that the calves that were just fence lined weaned, they actually walked less, bawled less those first two or three days after weaning. They rested more and they ate more. And that's important because that got those calves off to a better start. In fact, they weighed the calves two weeks after the weaning process started. Those that were fence lined weaned had gained 23 more pounds than did those that were totally separated from their mothers. And that difference in gain has stayed intact uh, clear on out 10 weeks after the weaning process where the uh, calves that were fence line weaned still maintained an advantage they'd gained about 26 uh, more pounds than did the counterparts that had been totally separated. So I think this does illustrate that it is less stressful, it gets those calves off to a little better start. Ranchers here in Oklahoma that have tried fence line weaning always will have me point out to others that we talk to that the importance of water in the case of fence line weaning, because you want to remember for the first couple of days, We've got cows and calves congregated in a very small area during this uh, warm weather. And it's going to require lots of water in that area. We want to remember that it has to be water that those calves, those seven, eight month old calves on one side of the fence can reach to drink readily during that weaning process so that they don't get dehydrated. So plan ahead before you consider fence line weaning this summer to make sure that, that water is available on both sides in adequate amounts to meet their needs. I think you really want to consider fence line weaning when you wean calves this summer. Less stress, they get off to a better start, but plan ahead. Make sure there's water on both sides that those cattle can reach. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. It is that time of year where we see little rallies in the wheat market, and Kim, we're seeing one right now. Yeah, earlier in the week, prices went down about 20 cents. We gained that 20 cents back, plus a little bit later in the week. I think the good news is we saw an increase in the basis this week, and that means that the market's wanting our, this, this wheat that Oklahoma's harvesting. I think the reason we got the rally is uh, their lowered expectations in Russia, Ukraine, Australia, Germany, all for dry conditions. I think that looks favorable for our prices in the future. Throughout the, the, the wheat growing season, it's been pretty dry in Oklahoma, but it's wet right now. What does that mean for the markets? Well, it means that test weight for, for wheat that's ready to harvest, mm -hmm. test weight's probably gonna be lower than it would be if they could have got it in front of this rain. We need test weight as well as protein. Mm -hmm. So it's not good for the producers that haven't got their wheat in the bin yet. However, for producers that's got the corn, the sorghum, the soybeans, the, the sesame, the summer crops in the ground, it's excellent for them. Mexico's been in the news right now with some, uh, some of the trade issues. What does that mean for Oklahoma producers? Well, if you look at uh, hard red winter wheat being exported to Mexico, you know, Mexico is either the number one or number two uh, importer of U.S. wheat, you know, with Japan. Uh, you look at the uh, 
class of wheat that Mexico imports. It's about two thirds, around 66% hard red winter wheat, probably around 30, 25, 30% soft red winter wheat. And then you've got uh, your whites and your springs coming in their mix. That's very important to Oklahoma prices that, that Mexico imports our wheat. However, where are they going to uh, buy wheat if they don't get it from Oklahoma? If they can't get it from Argentina. They already get some from Argentina, but Argentina the last three years has had 9 million bushels ending stocks. That's not enough to meet, you know, meet up any demand. Huh. I think the joker in the deck is Russia. Remember, Russia exported grain into Venezuela this last year. And, you know, there's some little light rumors in the market that Russia may try to get into Mexico. That is something to watch. Okay, and we will watch it. Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And now here's Alex Rocatelli with some information on Johnson grass used for forage. All right, so we are here back in the pasture rewrap location. And as we saw last time, we control some of our broad leaves. And as you can see, most of them knock it down after a herbicide application. But there are other plants coming here that might be a problem. One of them that's pretty common that comes pretty aggressively right now is Johnson grass. And there is always that question, is Johnson grass a weed or a forage? Well, keep in mind that Johnson grass was introduced here as a forage. And actually, it's a good forage. We have about 15%, 14% crude protein and a TDN of 60%. But the problems that we have here in Oklahoma is that first, this is considered noxious weed. So that's why sometimes you wanted to control it. And also, uh, you can have nitrate and also prussic acid toxicities. So the plant, uh, again, uh, can concentrate nitrate or prussic acid and those can be in certain level uh, toxic to the animal. So that's why we need to avoid that the animal, cattle or horses, eat those plants when they have a high concentration. Uh, when that high concentration comes, let's say if the plant stays in a drought condition for too long and after comes a rain, after the rain that wake up those plants from the drought time is when we are going to have a high concentration of nitrates and or prussic acid. So after a rain that followed a drought period, it's better that at least you wait like four or five days before cutting for hay or introducing cattle. So in order to control Johnson grass, we can think about overgrazing, mechanical control by mowing or herbicides. One thing that I want to make people aware is that lots of times uh, I, I hear from people that uh, they, they think that Johnson grass will be poisonous when the leaves show a kind of a white powder at the top. Uh, I would say that that's pretty much a myth that's not true. Uh, Johnson grass can be with high concentrations of nitrate and also prussic acid regardless having that white powder or not. For sure, the ultimate test would be a forage sample that you're going to send to a lab and they will even do the analysis and come with the right concentration that you have of those toxicities. You know, at the end of a long day or after mowing in the hot sun, sometimes it's really good to reach for a cold one. You know, a brewski, a barley pop, you know, just a beer. But you know, beer has become a lot more sophisticated, largely because of the boom in the craft beer industry. There's been a 14% increase in that industry from 2012 to 2017. So what defines a craft beer brewer? The National Brewers Association defines a craft brewery as small, independent, and traditional. By small, the association means less than 6 million barrels of annual production, which equates to about 3% of the U.S. beer market. These craft beer flavors and styles include IPAs, lagers, pale ales, amber ales, seasonal beers, and fruit beers, plus a broad category of other, which derive flavor from ingredients besides the hops like wheat beers, sorghum beers, and stouts that include flavors from oatmeal, chocolate, or coffee. So what is driving this demand for craft beers over traditional beers, whose sales fell 16% from 2012 to 2017? 
Just like the food industry has seen a trend for exploration of new and less traditional flavors by consumers, so has the beverage industry, and this demand is largely driven by millennials. Oklahoma, which recently passed legislation to allow wine and strong beer sales in grocery stores this coming October, currently has 42 craft breweries. But that number is expected to grow significantly once the new law goes into effect, which will also simplify regulations regarding the sale of on-premise craft beers at the microbreweries. So the next time you want something cold and refreshing, reach for something a little more sophisticated and flavorful. Consider supporting the craft beer industry of Oklahoma. For more information about this trend or other interesting food trends, download FAPC's app. Visit SUNUP for more information. That'll do it for our show this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.